I believe most people are aware of the uh, extremely tragic series of events that transpired on January 1st and January 2nd of this year. Uh, resulted in the deaths of two people and multiple major crimes being committed against a dozen other persons. On January 1st, the trooper out of the Catanning Barracks was running speed on Route 28. He's on the Cheswick ramp going south towards the city of Pittsburgh. A black Honda uh, Civic comes by at about 90 miles an hour. The trooper engages his uh, siren and lights. He's going to pull him over. The driver does not comply. Uh, he's heading south towards the city of Pittsburgh. He stays on 28. Uh, the Allegheny County Chiefs and the, and the Pennsylvania State Police have adopted a policy where we do not pursue when a situation becomes dangerous to innocent persons. So the circumstances that began developing were that he's heading at a much higher rate of speed as he gets closer to the um, Highland Park Bridge. Uh, the trooper terminates uh, pursuit only after coming neck and neck with the guy. He can actually see the driver. There is a passenger in the vehicle. It's a male. Uh, he gets the plates and all the information, and the guy goes across the Highland Park Bridge and back ultimately to the city of Pittsburgh. On the same day, the state police interview uh, the owner of the vehicle, who is a resident of Furley Street in the city of Pittsburgh. His story is that on December 28th, three days previous, he noticed that the vehicle was gone. He's a mechanic. He runs a body shop. He previously gave the car to an Aaron Swan to test drive. Uh, the car, although it was returned, was, was taken out with a spare key. That's why Mr. Swan was in possession of the vehicle. Through information that was obtained from PennDOT, uh, phone numbers and contact information go back to a, a Aaron Lamont Swan who lives in the city of Duquesne with his mother. Uh, the trooper identified Swan through the criminal information database. It indicates that Swan has three active warrants. Two are criminal warrants, one is a parole warrant. And I'll explain that. I think I need to explain the history a little bit. Uh, Mr. Swan, who was age, age 28 at the time that he passed, has an extensive criminal history. He was adjudicated delinquent five different times. On August 27th of 2014, Swan, who committed a crime April 18th of 2014, was apprehended when he went into a convalescent care center in the East Liberty section of Pittsburgh. In the affidavit of probable cause charging him, when he ran from the police, he stumbled and fell. He was carrying a weapon. The weapon discharged into the ground. Uh, he was charged with the weapon offense. He was charged also with recklessly endangering others because police were in pursuit. Uh, there was some information that he had drawn down on the police. That, that is not true. It was an accidental discharge. Had he done that, uh, Mr. Swan would have been charged with uh, criminal attempt homicide, which carries penalties up to 40 years. Also in the same time frame, maybe the reason why Swan was running from the police on that particular day, on April 18th of 14, he was involved as a conspirator in the robbery of a drug dealer, low-level drug dealer on the north side. What Swan had been doing, according to statements that were given to the parole board, was that he, he was now robbing drug dealers, low-level drug dealers, mostly in the neighborhoods which he would frequent. He was arrested with a man named Justin Bonner. He was the shooter of the drug dealer. As we always do, we look at the level of complicity of any persons in a conspiracy. Uh, Bonner was sentenced to, or excuse me, was convicted of third degree murder. Uh, for his involvement in this particular crime, Swan was convicted of robbery and convicted of conspiracy. He got three to six years in a penitentiary. This particular crime was committed. It was committed before he was chased by the police in August for a different crime. And he had a weapon at that time would have taken him back to the pen should have taken him back to the penitentiary. Um, but as a result of, of this, he got three to six years. His minimum parole date was May 15th of 18. His maximum parole date was May 15th of 2021. Uh, subsequent to parole on May 9th of 2019, he gets involved in drugs and he flees from the police. He was uh, violated by the parole board. He went back to the penitentiary. He was recommitted for 18 months. His new eligible date for parole was November 9th of 2020. After parole, he gets snatched DUI in the city. He pleads guilty to time served. Subsequent to that, he commits two crimes, one on November 13th of 21 and one on December 25th of 21. The one in December is a petty crime. It's a theft from a car. That's what these guys were doing. The crime that was committed on November 13th of 21 is, is significant. A person uh, in the city of Pittsburgh reported that his car was broken into. The theft on that particular occasion was uh, five weapons, two handguns, a shotgun, a long rifle, and uh, a hunting bow. Uh, one of the weapons, and I'll get into that a little bit when we talk about the guns, 
Um, uh, one of the weapons was recovered from the back seat of the plumber's van uh, in Brackenridge. The sequence of events began on January 2nd, 23. At 11.15, the state police participating in a, in a multi-county information sharing system with my office and with the Allegheny County Chiefs of Police sought information on the location of a black Honda with particular types of plates. The plates and the information on the Honda were circulated through uh, approximately 3,000 points of information across Allegheny County and the five contiguous counties to us. There's approximately 600 LPRs that are in place, so we use this system as a passive system. So when we're looking for somebody, for instance, and the information is in there, it goes to 1,000, 3,000 actually different points of information. It engages every law enforcement agency in five counties. The information that we have available to the police goes back at least, goes back six months. And you can look at the history of the movement of that vehicle throughout Allegheny County. This gives you an idea of the density of the area. Major intersections in Harrison Township, which are primarily on Freeport Road, are um, part of our system. So on this particular day, based upon the inquiry, which was made by the state police, we can find him at 945 being in Harrison Township. The vehicle has a history of being there more than, on more than one occasion. At 1130, the trooper contacts Chief Klein. His officers brief the state police on what they believe to be a pattern of Mr. Swan's movements. So Harrison and the adjoining municipalities are now looking for Mr. Swan. Harrison picks him up at the sheets. He's at one of the pumps. He's accompanied by a man named Stanley Williamson and is one of the reasons why uh, Swan spends so much time up here. When he's identified by the police and the police approach, Swan takes off out of the sheets and heads down California Avenue. It's a three minute drive to the 800 block of, of 9th Avenue in Brackenridge. The black Honda that he was in is damaged already. And he abandons the vehicle here. He can't drive it anymore, so that, you know he's done with that particular car. So he exits the vehicle, he heads down Webster and flees on foot. The next time we pick him up, uh, there's a tavern. It's called Devil Dogs. It's on 6th Street in uh, Brackenridge. But approximately 1245, Swan makes it to 6th Avenue alone. He moves across the tracks towards 3rd Avenue in the river. At 212, he comes back from the area that's on the other side of the track, 3rd Street. He comes back and he's still alone. Now he's in the wind for an hour and a half and the police are looking for him right now. And when I say the police, I'm talking about Harrison, Tarentum, Fawn, Allegheny Valley. And that's the nucleus of the units that work together up there and they work together very well. Sometime between, and I believe the accurate time would be 2.35, a call comes in. At, a woman, uh, the caller says between 2 and 2.30, uh, persons uh, matching the excuse me, description of Swan uh, and the other gentlemen um, are seen throwing a hoodie into a garbage can. And this is a 300 Bridge Street which runs contiguous to 3rd Street, still on the river side of the railroad tracks. At 302 there's a call of two suspicious men around an area where the Honda had been abandoned. Uh, we're speculating about this, but I believe the two guys are looking for another vehicle so they can get out of so they can get out of town. At 4:08, there are two men in front of Devil Dogs. Devil Dogs has an audio and video system outside of their bar. This is Mr. Swan. This is Mr. Williamson. Swan is now dressed differently. He's lost the hoodie. He had two bags previously: this one and this one. Apparently, he's, they've, they've switched the bags up. We're speculating about this too, but there's a heated argument between the two on audio. Um, we believe it's possible that um, Swan knows that those guns are going to put him back in a penitentiary for a long time. Brackenridge joins in the uh, search for Swan, and Chief McIntyre calls in at approximately 4:13. He says Swan is is on Third Street, moving towards or between houses towards Brackenridge. Brackenridge Street runs parallel to Third. So Chief McIntyre and a Toronto police officer, Officer Schreckengoss, are on the Third Avenue side. There are several police officers coming in from the Brackenridge side on the back end. These two separate. He heads down 6th. He heads the other way. At 413, that's when Swan is across the tracks down on 3rd Avenue, and he's seen going in between the houses by Chief McIntyre. This is the front of the house on 3rd Street. Swan heads in through this cut in the houses. Chief McIntyre follows him in there. This is the rear of the property. Swan continued to proceed out of the area. I think he doesn't proceed any further this way where Brackenridge Street is because the police are down there. So they're moving into the back. Had he wanted to exit that way, he probably sees or hears police activity and, and decides not to. He takes cover here, so he's hiding in this area. The chief is coming this way. The chief has unholstered his taser. He never removes his service weapon from his belt. The taser is equipped with a video. This is kind of tough. This is a still from 
the video on the taser. You see that he's got the weapon out. It's a 40 caliber weapon. That is it ultimately becomes the murder weapon. This is the last thing that Chief McIntyre sees. Within a split second, the first of five shots was taken. You can see that the laser from the uh, taser. The chief is standing on this side closest to this building. He's at an angle and he has the taser out. Shots are fired. Ballistics indicate that there are five shell casings at the scene. Chief McIntyre struck four times. That first shot, when he comes around the corner the first time, uh, we believe hits the chief in the hand, goes through his wrist, hits the taser to some extent, migrates up his arm, hits him in the face. He spins, the second shot comes and hits him in the rear end, um, left buttocks. He goes down. Um, there are two, two more shots that strike the chief. It appears that the chief was in a prone situation. He was prone. And uh, the last strikes, uh, according to the medical examiner, were from a weapon that was about 15 to 18 inches from the chief. And they show a trajectory going back to front, and they're both head wounds. This is the Salvation Army lot. The house where the chief encountered Swan is about 16 homes from the intersection of this street, Morgan, and 3rd. Officer Schreckengost is about 10 houses from that corner. Gun, gun, gun! Stop! Running towards Morgan right now. On Morgan. He's, he's responding to what Chief McIntyre had indicated that this guy was on 3rd Avenue. He was heading between the houses towards Brackenridge Avenue. Swan comes from 3rd Avenue of Morgan. This is Pierce Plumbing. Pierce has engaged him. At least two shots are fired. Avenue. Oh! Shot, shots fired! Shots fired! Shots fired! The casings from the gun that was fired there are the same casings from the murder scene. Mr. Pierce takes the weapon from Swan, tells Schreckengoss as he comes by that he's got the weapon. And based upon that information, in part, Officer Schreckengoss is going to engage Swan. Officer Schreckengoss believes that threat as to the weapon may no longer exist. So what he does is he comes wide here, expecting him to, to come out of cover and expose himself. And he's getting a better angle on that. Swan is at the rear of the vehicle. We have him pinned in the garage right here. I'm hit! I'm hit! I'm hit! Schreckengoss is hit here. He was struck in the leg. And he heads back down the street where he gets aid. Officers from Terenum, Fawn, and Harrison Township start to converge. You can get away from the property out through the rear of that location on Morgan Street. AC, which is identified as AC, does not belong to Mr. Swan. Weapon AD was one of the weapons that was taken from Kovac at one of the Giant Eagles, together with the other weapons that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that weapon is actually owned by a woman in Clareton, and obviously he gets into the possession of Mr. Swan. So at this point, Swan has exited from the rear of the Morgan Street address. Now he's in the wind. This is where Chief McIntyre is. This is Morgan Street. And ultimately, the next episode comes up to Pacific Avenue in an area that's proximate to the middle school. You can see the distance is about six-tenths of a mile. Swan's ties are with Sheldon Park up in Harrison. So Sheldon Park and Harrison are to the north. So any search area, obviously the river helps, but any search area would emphasize going in that particular direction. All right, this is the third major crime scene that's involved on that day. What happened is he comes up from 3rd Street. He must have come through two houses that are across the street from a house that he ultimately robbed the owners of their vehicle. And he did that at gunpoint. There was a blood trail, according to the county police, somewhere in here. So somebody hit Swan along the way. Not enough to keep him from moving six-tenths of a mile, approximately, and winding up on Pacific Avenue. What Swan does is he finds, and this, I guess this is not uncommon in Brackenridge, somebody with their door open. Um, he goes in the door, invades the home, puts a gun in the face of the, of the um, mom, uh, the woman in the house. Her husband is on oxygen. He's not well. So this is a traumatic experience for him, uh, regardless of whatever else happens. Um, he wants their car. He takes the car. Um, he tells them, if you say anything to the police, give me 10 minutes or I'm going to come back and kill you or something to that effect. Uh, obviously, he's a very serious man. They give him the 10 minutes. So he takes the car. Now it's, we're going to use our camera system and we're going to use the relationships we have between police departments a little bit differently. 
if you got the, now we have the license plate of the vehicle, now it's an active search as opposed to a passive search. The car apparently gets on to 28 and heads down into the city of Pittsburgh. It was a Subaru Legacy. Legacy crashes at Myrtle and Columbia. It's an area approximate to Homewood and Brushton in that area. And the police are kind of waiting for them in the city because as you come down 28, you go across the Highland Park Bridge, you go through a checkpoint that the city has placed down there. So they know that that vehicle is now on uh, Allegheny River Boulevard heading towards Washington Boulevard. Ultimately, it comes up Washington past the Academy and makes a right onto Shetland. That's just before Frankstown Road. So Shetland takes you into Lincoln, Larimer, you know, which is all just part of uh, really one neighborhood. Vehicle crashes here at Myrtle. Ultimately, Swan winds up over here in the Hart Court complex of Homewood. There are numerous police officers now who are looking for him. Uh, the city has an organized task force which deals with violent crime. They also have the narcotics guys working together with these guys. This is a surveillance video from Hart Court. That's Swan. Those are two Pittsburgh police detectives, Slackoff and Stump. What you saw was Swan coming this way through the area of building 1332. Officers follow him here comes around the corner, he winds up over here. He can't go any further because the Pittsburgh police are down here and they've formed a skirmish line. So they're coming up this hill. So Swan believes he can't go any further. The two Pittsburgh police officers take this route and then come back. This is slack off, this is stumped down here. So all these items of evidence, these go back to the Pittsburgh police officer, these go back to the Pittsburgh police officer, these go back to Mr. Swan. So this is Detective Slackoff's body cam. Watch that corner. Get on the ground. Get on. Watch it. Get up. Get up. It's a daylight view of that area. Detective Slackoff took a position. He went down this way, came back, took a position here. Detective Stumpf followed the whole way down there and he's engaged in a firefight with Swan with no cover. That's an automatic weapon they're up against. Okay, those first two volleys are from, uh, from Swan's weapon. It's a fully automatic weapon. He's modified the weapon. The exchange of gunfire lasted approximately 18 seconds. That's over 60 shots, close to 70 shots. 21 casings go back to Swan. I believe 22 and 23 go back to the different detectives, respectively. Swan is, is shot and killed uh, at that scene. Officer Stumpf, uh, I think he dislocated his right knee. He takes shrapnel to the eye, he takes shrapnel to the arm. Uh, he's lucky he's not dead because, as I said earlier, he's, he's not in a cover position. You can see from the ballistics, these are spent casings that go back to Officer Slackoff. These are casings and evidence that goes back to Mr. Swan. This is how they modify the weapons, and this is an extended clip. The clip can hold 24 rounds. As I said, 21 casings were recovered from that particular location. The weapon that was used against Chief McIntyre that was taken into custody, the three other weapons that were there that were in the bag, they were all not owned by Swan, and that's a problem we routinely, unfortunately, were encountering with the community about straw purchasers of weapons and, and such. The weapon that was used to shoot Officer Schreckengost is a 40. That's we can't find that right now. The evidence is pretty overwhelming in terms of uh, the crimes that Mr. Swan has, has committed. Um, I want to thank the Allegheny County Police for uh, putting this together. I think you're going to find that, you know, as these guys uh, continue to use technology, you're going to see things like the use of drones and, and, and such, but I don't think there's any question as to what happened that day. You guys certainly can come to your own conclusions. Chief McIntyre was ambushed and murdered. I think he demonstrated everything that you want a police officer to do. And uh, he had no intention of taking life. That's why everybody in the community loved him. Schreckengoss is going to be fine. So how dangerous was he? The officers come onto the, the Honda initially. There's an empty holster. And I believe part of the communication to the other police officers was that there's an empty holster. There may be a gun in play. Now, when you get into the city, it's a different, it's a different issue. They know him. These are, these are detectives who are dedicated to violent crime and narcotics. And they work those neighborhoods. 
Marcus Swan is somebody of interest to them, and, and they had a pretty good idea of the background, but they also knew that he had murdered a police officer, shot another police officer, put a gun in a woman's face, carjacked that, that person, robbed and carjacked that person. And you know, whatever conclusions you want to reach about the evidence and who they are or make any moral decisions, I, I don't do that. I'm not making any moral decisions. As to the death of Mr. Swan, there's overwhelming evidence of justification for the officers to do what they did. I think you, you, just from the um, shot spotter alone, you can see uh, the first two, the first 21 shots at least, came from Mr. Swan's weapon. And they came at a time when both officers were no, not in cover positions, but they were moving. We would not be having this discussion in this detail, certainly, without all the technology that the police have embraced. Body cams, I think, are some, one of the most important improvements that we've made as a community. And when we've used body cams across the country, I've seen studies, 80% of complaints against police officers disappear. So these self-appointed community activists that come in and they tell you what the situation is, or, and it's not accurate or it's not truthful. That stuff is true. That's true. Or at least you can, make, you can come to your own conclusion and nobody has to try to convince you one way or the other.